Well, hey, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Welcome everybody here online. Uh, go ahead and jump on here with us. And uh, really, it's so much better if you come here live on, on campus, but I know some of you are not even in the state. And so, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. And ta uh, go ahead and start tagging a few friends. Get them in here. Tell us where you're watching from. And we're glad that you have joined us and come our way. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. They're at home as well. Open up your Bibles. It's really important whether we worship here on campus or worship at home, that we really have our Bibles opened up. We have all distractions removed. And we're really ready to focus in on what God wants to teach us. Sometimes we get too comfortable and we just uh, don't really anticipate the Holy Spirit moving. So what we expect is what we're going to get. And if we expect God to move in a mighty way, uh, he will move in a mighty way. If we expect very, uh, very little, uh, then we're going to get very little. And so God always works in the context of our faith. So it's really important whether it's my daily quiet time. I don't want to just get up in the morning and say, well, I got to have my quiet time and, and here's where the Lord's got me now. No, I want to expect that God is going to come and speak into my life when I have my daily quiet time. In the morning, I'm waiting to hear from the Lord. And I'm, I'm always amazed at how much more he gives me than I'm even expecting. And I am sometimes ashamed because my faith was not strong enough. Uh, but it really is important that we expect that God would move. So I hope that you'll do that today here on campus, there online, as we look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. We're looking at part two of this subject, sinners and saints. I like it when the Bible makes things so clear that there's no confusion in all of my heart and my mind. And I can really say, hey, that was so easy to understand. Now, there are a few verses in the Bible, we say, I got to really uh, kind of chew it over a little while before I can really figure that out. But sometimes it's absolutely crystal clear that anybody, even a little child, can understand it. And that's the context of where we're at today in these, these verses. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 through 15, let's stand together all over the building. There at home, when your Bible's opened up, as we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. And what a blessing it is that we have our Bibles. You know, over in China, they would love to have a copy of God's Word like we have here. And, and when they get them, you know what they do? They cry and they hug them and they kiss them. And, and that's what my friend Brian said they were doing down in Costa Rica as well. Uh, they were so happy to get a Bible. They're, they're just poor. They don't have the money. So they got a Bible. So God help us to never take for granted the blessed book we have in front of us. First John chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. You fall on as I read because this now is God's living Word. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil. And his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Let's pray together. Our great and awesome God, we stand in awe of you. We are so overwhelmed uh, by your mercy and by your grace poured out upon us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are so grateful that you have allowed us to have the Holy Spirit as our guide this morning. And Father, I pray that you would even now remove every single distraction, both internal and external. Let our hearts and our minds not wander. Let our eyes not wander. Let us stay focused today and what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us through your word. And Lord, I pray for even those at home that they would listen intently to what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell them. And Father, only your spirit knows who really is born again and who is just a false convert. And Father, I beg you in Jesus' name, if there's anybody who hears my voice that does not know your son as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that today they repent of all their sins and surrender right now. And Father, I pray for anybody walking at a guilty distance who's not living the Christian life that you've enabled them to live. Lord, I pray that today they will come home. Lord, I pray for anybody with a burden on their heart. Lord, with the Spirit of God, even now, remove those burdens and let them lay it down at the foot of the cross. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment as you open up your word to us. Speak, and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. 
Well, last week we looked at the uh, positive side of it. We looked at those who love others belong to the Savior. That one of the evidences that I've been born again is because I love people. Uh, and, and as a result of that, uh, God commanded us to love everybody. We looked at that several verses last week. We had to love even our enemies, Jesus told us. And so there really is no, uh, no excuse for withholding love. We're going to look at that in more detail next week as John gives a very practical illustration and example of somebody who says, I love, but yet they fail to show that love. And John would say, that's not true. And so we were reminded of God's standard. He told us that we are to love. And this was not some new commandment. Uh, they had known about it before. It really uh, came to fruition in Jesus Christ. Nobody had ever seen love before until the Lord Jesus Christ came and really described to us and displayed for us what love was. And he gave everything. And uh, you really cannot do any more for somebody than give your very own life. And so Jesus did that uh, for you and I. And he wants you to spread the word to a lost and dying world. Then we looked at the reassurance of our salvation. And we looked at several verses there talking about how we can know that we are born again. Well, now today, what John does, he contrasts uh, what we looked at last week, that Christians who love others and belong to the Savior. And now John gets real with us as he shows us those who loathe others belong to Satan. Those who loathe others belong to Satan. If you hate other people, he says, the reality is you don't belong to the Lord, you belong to the devil. Now, notice the murderer's true father. The murderer's true father. I'm going to tell you why I use that term murderer uh, here in a little bit. Look at verse 10. He says, By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Now, you can't make it any clearer than that. He said, it's really, it's very obvious. And if you don't know, you're just not being honest with yourself. You're not listening to God as he speaks to you. Because he said, it's very, very obvious who belongs to God and who belongs to God. To the devil. And so how do I know, John? Help me out. How do I know what's so obvious? He says, anyone, and he leaves no room for exceptions, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. In other words, if you don't practice righteousness, then you're not born again. You belong to the devil. And he goes on to say in verse 10, nor the one who does not love his brother. So what he's saying is if you don't practice righteousness and if you don't love others, you do not belong to God. Now, the Bible has no gray areas. There's no room for confusion. There's no guesswork. I really love uh, John. It's been a, a great, great study so far, and he's really very, very clear. My favorite book in the Bible is probably James because James is so uh, black and white, no gray areas. It, it's a book about if you say you're a born-again Christian, show me some evidence, give, give me some fruit in your life to give evidence you've been born again. And John is kind of the same way. Uh, John is real clear. Clear. He says, let me make it very clear to you. I don't care what you say. What I want to see is what you show. And James was the same way. He said, you say you have works, but yet I don't see no, uh, no, no, no faith. You say you have faith, but I see no works to evidence that faith. And so John makes it very clear there's only two groups of people. We love to divide people up into many, many groups, but the Bible only knows about two groups of people in the world. The Bible's not concerned about your race, not concerned about your social economic status, not concerned about your political views, not concerned about whether you're a man or a woman. When the Bible understands two groups, those who belong to God, the children of God, those that are saved, and the children of the devil, those who are lost. So in heaven, there's going to be people from every tongue and every tribe and every nation, John tells us, all over the place. And in hell, there's going to be the same thing. People from every tongue and tribe and nation. What's the difference? What they did with Jesus. Those who repented of their sins and surrendered to Jesus, they get in, regardless of whether they're white, black, young, old, doesn't matter. Those who don't receive Jesus Christ and reject him, they go to hell. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what they've done here on this earth, Jesus is a dividing factor. And so there's only two groups of people, lost and saved, children of God and children of the devil. Now look what he said there in verse 10. He says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness does not belong to God. And the converse will be true. Those who do practice righteousness do belong to God. The first half of this verse draws our attention back to what we looked at earlier on in verses 5 through 9. Uh, John went on to say there in, in verse 5, he says, You know that he appeared, Jesus appeared, in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 
No one who abides in him sins, and that speaks about practicing a lifestyle of sinning. Uh, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. In other words, if your lifestyle is characterized by sin, you're not a born-again Christian. Then he says, little children, it's a term of endearment. Little children, he's not talking to little kids. He's just saying little children. Uh, you know, sometimes people call me a kid. Can you believe that, John? <laughs> but if I talk to these kids over here, they'll wonder how I'm still alive. So it's all perspective. So he says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. John was very concerned about them not being deceived. The original context of the letter is they have all these false teachers that are trying to lead them astray. And we've got to watch out for false teachers out there today. That's why John told us this morning in our life group, you really got to know your Bible. And if you're going to grow, you've got to know what the Bible says so that somebody else can't come along and say it says this. You can say, wait a minute now, that doesn't sound like the Bible I have. The one who practices righteousness, here it is, is righteous. Just as he is right. God is righteous. And if I belong to him, I will practice righteousness. It doesn't mean that I'm sinless and I'll never commit a sin. It simply means that my lifestyle will be characterized by holy living rather than by sinful living. The overall general lifestyle that I have, even though I will stumble and fall along the way. Then he says in verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. Well, you can't get any clearer than that. The devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So what God wants to do in your life, he wants to destroy the works of the devil in your life. And what he wants to do, he wants to put the Holy Spirit inside of me and say, John, you don't have to go down that path any longer. You don't have to do that any longer. You don't have to talk that way any longer. You don't have to go to those places any longer. You're different now. And you ought to act different if you say you belong to Christ. And so God destroyed those works, and now I've got to walk in the victory that he already gave me. So verse 9 says, No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed, the Holy Spirit, abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And we looked at that a couple weeks ago. Now we saw that no true Christian can live a life of sin because God's Holy Spirit, the seed that we just read about, won't allow it. Well, what will happen if I sin? If I'm walking in fellowship with God, what will happen is, when I go to sin, the Holy Spirit will get a hold of me. And he'll bring deep conviction in my life. And then the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 12, what will happen is, God will go to work in your life. And he will work you over. And he will discipline you because you have sin in your life. And what will happen is, if I don't have that discipline in my life, then I've got to say to myself, do I really know my father? Now, I told you, I don't go to Walmart and straighten out all the kids. Sometimes I want to, but I don't do that because I get in trouble. Uh, so I just discipline my kids. And God says, I'm not going to discipline the devil's kids. Let him worry about them. When they come to me, they have a relationship with me, then I will discipline them. And they will be disciplined. And so I cannot live a life of sin and get away with it and expect that the Holy Spirit's okay with that. He is not. Now, notice that word righteousness. It speaks of a character that is right or just. A person who does not know God cannot practice righteousness because they are not righteous in their character. The only righteousness we can get is from God, from Jesus Christ himself. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The Bible says, He made him, God the Father made the Son, who knew no sin, he never committed any sin in his life, to be sin on our behalf. Why did he do that? So that, here's the purpose clause, here's why God, the Father, made God, the Son, my sin. Here's why he did it. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So what God did was he took an exchange on Calvary. He said, John, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. Because I love you so much, I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to suffer the wrath of a holy God in your place. And then what I'm going to do is if you receive that free gift that I want to give you, what I'm going to give to you is the righteousness that you're required to get in. So how do I get into heaven? I've got to be perfect. The only problem is I'm not perfect. Don't say amen, Lewis. And what it means is that I am a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And I can only be perfect if I have the righteousness of Almighty God in my life. And I only get that righteousness if I receive Jesus Christ, my personal Lord and Savior. And so that's why he became righteousness. Not my self-righteousness. I'll never get in my self-righteousness. It's got to be the righteousness of God that gets me in there. And he said, what happens now is they'll practice that righteousness. But if I don't have the Holy Spirit in me, if I don't have a relationship with God, it is not possible to practice that righteousness. So just as a child of God can commit an act of sin, but not live a sinful life, 
The same is true of a child of the devil. They may occasionally do some good deed, but they cannot practice as a lifestyle righteousness because they don't have the desire and they don't have the ability, they don't have the strength because they don't have the Holy Spirit. Now our desire is to love holiness while well, their desire is to love sin. So when you're trying to talk to your friend, you're trying to invite them to come to church and say, why in the world would I want to give up a beautiful Sunday morning and go down there to that church? Uh, why would I do that when I can go hit the lake? Why would I want to do that when I can go to the beach? Why would I want to do that when it's my only day off and I just want to relax and kick up my feet here at the house? Because they have no desire for the things of God. When you say to them, hey, I want to engage in a conversation with you about God, uh, they don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about a ball game. They want to talk about the movies. They want to talk about politics. They don't want to talk about God because they have no desire for the things of God. There's no prompting of the Holy Spirit to do those things. And so while we love these things, they find it a great burden. And false converts, they may go to church, but the entire time they're in church, they're thinking, how long is this going to take? Let me get out of here as quick as possible. Somebody said they start church at 11 o'clock sharp, end at, 11, at 12 o'clock dull. I had a buddy of mine say, what they'll do is they go to the ball games and they'll shout like a wild Indian, then they come to church and sit there like a wooden Indian. You never have to motivate somebody who loves God. They get fired up on their own. So all true righteousness and love come from God and God alone. We're going to look at later on in chapter 4, the Bible says God is love. So he, he doesn't just love other people, he is love. He's the very epitome of love. And he is all about love. And Satan is no love in his heart at all for anything but himself. Therefore, those who don't know God cannot practice love, and they cannot practice righteousness. Now look at verse 11. So he says, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then he says, but, but don't do it like Cain. He says, let me tell you how you not to love other people. Verse 12, not as Cain. Yeah, don't, don't love somebody like that. Uh, who was of the evil one, so Cain was lost. He had no relationship with God. And he slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Wow. So God commands us to love one another. But since Cain, like every child of the devil, didn't know or obey God, he showed hatred instead of love. Now he says there that Cain was of the evil one, Satan, and he slew his brother. He killed his brother. Wow. This is the only direct reference to the Old Testament that John makes in the entire letter. Well, let's take a closer look. Let's go back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, and let's read the story. Your first book, the fourth chapter, verse 1. They're at home? Move those pages. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And let's take a look at exactly what John's talking about here. So John says, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve. Talking about Adam and Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Abel was a shepherd, and Cain, he was a farmer. Now look what it says there in verse 3. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Notice that phrase of the course of time. It means at the end of the season. So what he did was he waited until the end of the season. And then he looked around and said, I think I can have enough, enough uh, crops here, fruit and vegetables and everything, and then I'm going to give a little bit to God. So it would be like somebody saying, I went out, I spent all the money I wanted to spend, and then now that i got a little bit of money left over, I'm going to throw that in the offering plate. And so what he did was he put himself first, and he put God last. And so he came to give an offering to God, but it was the leftovers. Well, what did Abel do? Verse 4. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock. So what Abel did was he said, God, i got a couple of sheep right here, and they had a baby. And what I'm going to do, God, I'm going to give you that one. And then in faith, I'm going to believe that you're going to give me more. Because I don't know if I'm going to get any more at all. That may be my, my last hope, and I gave it to you. But he said, I'm going to believe that you're going to honor my offering, you're going to honor my faith, and you're going to multiply the flock for me. 
And then he said, And the Lord had regard for Abel for his offering. In other words, he, he received it. He was pleased with it. Uh, and, and Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 says that Abel offered a better offering than Cain because of his faith. It's all about the faith. Now Cain, he brought a fruit offering where Abel brought a blood sacrifice. And Abel did it the right way, the way God wanted to do it. But Cain said, you know what, I'm not going to go God's way. I'm not going to offer up a, a blood sacrifice. He could have gone to his brother and said, hey, I don't have any sheep, but you do. So what I'll do is I'll sell you some of my vegetables and I'll trade you for one of your sheep. So he could have offered the right kind of offering, but he just said, I don't want to do it. So he waited until the end of the season. He did not offer in faith and he offered the wrong kind of offering because his heart wasn't right. And we're going to see that in a minute. And so he says, but, but Abel, the right kind of offering. But verse 5, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. In other words, he rejected it. He said, I'm not pleased with it. I don't want it. Get it out of here. And he rejected Cain's offering. So what happened to Cain? Uh, did, did he go back and did he repent and say, you know what? I'm sorry, God. I, I try to get away with giving you something you don't want. Uh, and I want to make things right because I recognize that I'm a sinner and I deserve to be punished. Uh, no, he didn't do that. What did he do? Verse 5 tells us what he did. And the Bible says, so Cain became very angry. Wow, not just a little bit upset. He's very angry. And his countenance fell. Who, who's he angry at? He's angry at God and he's angry at his brother. He didn't come God's way. He had an opportunity to repent and he didn't repent. He had an opportunity to offer the right kind of offering. He didn't do it. You know what Cain did? What everybody else with a false religion does, they try to come through works and go their way. But Hebrews 9.22 makes it very clear, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. That's why Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. God had already offered a sacrifice on behalf of Adam and Eve. Remember, they had fig leaves. They, they were trying to do it by works, cover up their sin, hiding in the bushes as though God couldn't find them. And then what God did was He slew a lamb on their behalf. And then He gave them the clothes to wear. And so they knew it had to be a blood sacrifice that had to be done in faith. He didn't either. So then it says in verse 6, now God in his patience. Now he's, remember, he's very angry at God. And we're going to see how he's very angry at his brother here in a second. But then verse 6 says, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? He's trying to reason with him. He's a very patient God. Uh, I tell you what, uh, sometimes you're dealing with somebody and they're getting angry at you and you say, why are you angry at me? It's your fault. And then you're not so patient with him. God was very patient. He did the same thing with Jonah in chapter 4. He said, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Then he gives him a warning. He, he tries to motivate him. Cain, if, if you'll listen to me and do what I tell you to do, uh, everything's going to be all right. I'm, I'm going to give you a second chance now. Uh, go, go talk to your brother, get the right kind of offering, and come back and try it again, and I'll accept it. Do it the right way. So he's being very patient with him, very gracious, very merciful. But then he gives him a word of warning. In the second half of verse 7, and if you do not do well, in other words, you don't come back and do it the way I told you to do it, he says, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. Wow. But you must master it. He says, sin is like a crouching lion. It's at the door. And what's going to happen is Satan is already at work in your heart, and I can see it. And he has motivated you to give me this false offering. He has brought anger into your heart. And you're angry at me and you're angry at your brother. And you have no cause to be angry at either one. And Satan is really working in your heart. And you better get your act together real fast. Because if you don't, here's what's going to happen. That sin is going to take control of your life. And you're going to do something that you don't want to do. You ever tell your kids, hold on now. Uh, you're a little bit upset. Maybe you need to go to your room for a few minutes and kind of catch your breath. Because you're fixing to say or do something that's going to cost you. And I'm trying to give you some leeway here, but you need to understand, if you continue down this path, there will be consequences. Okay? And so he tries to help him. He's very patient. Cain, be aware. I see the card of the time. I see where you're going, and you are fixing to make a drastic mistake. But of course Cain, because he didn't have a relationship with God, didn't listen to God, didn't care what God said, tried to go his own way, do his own thing. He says, uh, you got to master it. So what did Cain do? Verse 8, Cain told his brother. Can you picture that scene? He catches him out there, probably hanging around his flock. And then he, hey, uh, God take up your offering? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, he was very pleased with it. Uh, not mine. 
not mine. Instead of saying, can I get one of those lambs so I can go back and offer the right kind of offering and make God happy? No, he doesn't. He tells his brother, probably angry, yelling and screaming at his brother when he did it. And that's what it says here. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Wow. I'm going to tell you how he possibly killed him here in a minute. Then it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said to him, I do not know. So now he's lying. He's a murderer. He's a liar. He tried to uh, present to God a false offering. And he said, Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? Now God knows all this stuff. Just like he was trying to get him to confess it with Adam and Eve when he said, Hey, where are you all at? It wasn't that he couldn't find them. He was trying to get him to come out. And then he finally confessed, Oh, we were hiding in the bushes. What were you all doing in there? Uh, did you eat of the tree I told you not to? Uh, yes, we did. It wasn't that God was uh, unaware and he's trying to you know, investigate like some detective to find out what's going on. He already knew that. He's trying to get him to confess. You ever have your father do that to you? He'd ask you a series of questions and you could tell after about the second question, you already knew that he knew the answer. My, my dad did that one time and, uh, and I knew he already knew the answer. And I tried to lie my way out of it and it didn't work. It didn't work for Cain either. And so he says, uh, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Wow. Now you are cursed from the ground, which was open in, in his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate it, remember now he is a farmer. It used to be real easy to, uh, to farm. Not going to be that way no more now. It will no longer yield a strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Wow. Can you imagine? Now he's complaining to God. You ever have your kids do that? You said, I told you what to do. You didn't do it the right way. I gave you a chance to do it the right way. Then I pleaded with you to do it the right way. You didn't do it the right way. And I told you what was going to happen if you didn't do it the right way. And now you're coming to me and saying, this isn't fair. What do you mean you're taking my phone away? What do you mean I can't play video games? Yeah, be lucky you're living in this generation and not the 80s. Because my dad didn't know anything at all about timeouts and sit-down talks and conversations. <laughs> so he said, my punishment is too great to bear. Wow. Behold, you have driven me from this day, from the face of the ground, and from your face. That's what's really... It's one thing to be kicked out of the garden. But now I'm driving you away from God. Wow. You don't want that to happen. And I'll be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. The passion of the Lord again. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. Wow. Wait a minute now. He just slayed his own brother. And yet God says, I'm such a merciful and gracious God. That Cain, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, nobody will kill you out there. Wow. And he's over there whining, God, your punishment is too strong. Wow. Well, let's go back, because I've got to tell you how he murdered him here in a minute. Go back to 1 John. So the Bible says in verse 12, don't, don't love like Cain did. Uh, you know, with a, with a family member like that, uh, who, who needs enemies, right? I can honestly say that I, my brother never tried to kill me, and I never tried to kill him. We talk on a regular basis. We have a very good relationship. And we used to run the streets back in the day before we got saved. Now we're just hanging out with the Lord. And it says there in verse 12, he says, Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. Notice that word slew. It's in the New America Standard and the King James. The New King James and the Holman Christian Standard use the word Murder. It's a very vivid term in the Greek. It means to slaughter, to butcher by cutting the throat. It was used of animals killed in a sacrifice and refers to a violent death. Uh, John G. Butler says that perhaps John tells us exactly how Cain killed Abel. And I asked a, a pastor buddy of mine, I said, I don't know why we always hear that Cain killed his brother with a rock. We especially see that when there's a big shooting going on, they want to take everybody's guns away. They say it's not a gun problem, it's a heart problem. And then they'll say, you know, that just like Cain, he killed his brother with a rock. And I said, the Bible doesn't say that he killed him with a rock. It doesn't say how he killed him. But the language that John is using suggests that he cut his throat. What a violent and painful way to kill your own brother. 
and to kill him. And perhaps that's why all the blood is spilled out. And God said, he has blood's calling out to me from the ground. Wow. But it, was a, it pictured a very violent death. It wasn't just a, a simple little thing. It was a very violent death. It's the kind of way that he should have taken a lamb. That's what Abel would have done with the lamb that he offered up. He cut the throat, then the blood would spill out, and then he'd offer it up as a sacrifice to God. Wow. You've you got to be very, very evil to do something like that. Sometimes you hear about a murder on the news, and they say it's a crime of passion. And what they do is they, they'll uh, cut the throat many times. It's a very, very painful and uh, terrible death. And so a lack of love for others can lead to jealousy. It can lead to anger. It can lead to hatred. And even, in extreme cases, it can lead to murder. Nobody ever loves, uh, murders somebody they love. They always murder somebody that they hate. And it says there in verse 12, that not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil. We just saw that. God didn't receive his offering, but he did Abel's. Abel's was righteous. Now note that Cain didn't kill uh, Abel and become a child of the devil. He already belonged to the evil one. So it wasn't that we do an act and then we become a child of the devil. The reason why he did that, instead of showing love for his brother, instead of showing compassion, instead of listening to God when he warned him a couple of different times, uh, the reason why he did all those things because he didn't have a relationship with God, he didn't know him. And John says it very clearly that he is, a, uh, he is of the evil one. He said it in verse 10 that he is a, a, a child of God. He says it in verse four, uh, 14 and 15 that he is a murderer and he has no life abiding in him. Jesus also used very similar language when he was rebuking the Pharisees who were very religious and yet very lost. Listen to John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil. Wow. Talk about strong preaching. Now here he is talking to the Pharisees and he's saying, you're of your father the devil. Wow. And you want to do the desires of your father. Wow. He said he was a murderer from the beginning. The devil was. And they wanted to ultimately murder Jesus. And does not stand in the truth because he is, there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So Satan, uh, he hates people. He hates God ultimately. He doesn't so much care about us. He hates God. And he hates to see us worshiping God. So what he does because he hates God so much is he hates you and I. Because God loves us. Now, Satan is a liar, a murderer, and he loves evil. Those who practice such things are acting like the devil. They're doing the devil's work, and they reveal that they really belong to him. Rather than to God, who always tells the truth, who always loves everyone, and who always practices righteousness. And John makes it very clear in these verses. Loving others, evidence you belong to God. Hating others, evidence you belong to God to the devil. Now you might be saying, well that's okay because I've never murdered anybody. Hang on. Hang on. Because you might have. Hang on. So he says at the end of verse 12, he says, uh, because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. John tells us a very simple and obvious reason why Cain did what he did. The reason why he murdered his own brother was because his deeds were evil and his brothers was righteous. And we looked at the story already. And what he complained about was that God rejected his offering, but God received his brother's offering. And when he had a chance to make things right, he didn't make things right. And he got angry, and God warned him. So it wasn't like he just flew off the handle and did something and said, oh man, what did I do? He was already warned. The same thing was true many times in the scriptures where God warned other people that were lost about their actions and they didn't listen to him and they went out and did the devil's work. Judas did the same thing. When Jesus warned him, you are the man. And this was fixing to happen and he was warned about it. But what did he do? He went out and did it again anyway. And John says the reason why he did that was because he was evil and his brother was righteous. Wow. Well, we've seen the murderer's true father but let's take a quick look at the, mur the murderer's terrible fate. The murderer's terrible fate. Look at verse 14. It says, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. We know, uh, he who does not love abides in death. 
Now remember, I told you the language is very suspicious. We, 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 it's like backwards. You know, the, the Bible uses like backwards language to what we think about in our mind. If somebody died, you say, well, so-and-so passed away the other day. Well, that means that they died. It doesn't mean they're born. It means they die. You say, this person's been born. This person passed away. But we usually pass from life and we go into death. But the Bible talks about, because he's talking spiritually, not, not physically, and he's saying that he was, was dead, but now he's alive. But if he's not a born-again Christian, then he's, he's not. He's still abiding in the death that he was born into. So just we saw last week that loving others is evidence that we are born again. This week we see that a lack of love reveals that we have never been born again. F.F. F. Bruce put it this way in his commentary, love is the su supreme manifestation of the new life. So much so that anyone who fails to manifest it shows that he has never entered into a new life. He abides in death. Wow. Now notice that word abides. It says that he abides in death there in verse 14. It's in the present tense which signifies a current and remaining position. In other words, the one who does not love is still in a position of spiritual death. They're still lost and on the way to hell. Uh, we are born dead and must receive new life from God. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3. You must be born again. That word literally means born from above. I got to get new life, but I can't find it in myself. It's got to come from above. God gives the life. And so, and he makes me alive. Listen to what my condition was when I was lost. And if I've never received Christ, I'm still in this condition. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. He's saying, you're saved now, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them to uh, all formerly to all formerly lived in the lust. He said, this is the way we all were. Paul said, I was this way, you were this way, all of us were that way. If you're a born again Christian. If you're, not a, if you're not a born again Christian, you're still that way. So among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. John warned us about that up there in chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, here it is, children of wrath, even as the rest. So what it is, I was born dead in my trespasses. So I'm born physically alive, but spiritually dead. And what I need, I need to get spiritual life, even though I may physically die. So John says, a very powerful statement in verse 15, very clear, once again, no, no beating around the bush. It's not his personal opinion, because he's writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that means that God told him to write it down. It's not just his philosophies on life, not what he thinks. It's what God said. And he says, everyone, no exceptions, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Wow. Wait a minute now. A murderer. And you know, he's speaking to the church, then he's saying, and you guys know this, you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And in other words, you're not a born-again Christian. You're not going to go to heaven. You're not getting in. So I don't care what you say. I don't care what you claim. He says, you are a murderer if you hate others. Wow. And then, by the way, he's going he's gonna to help us to know, how can I know if I love somebody or not? He's going to tell me next week. So just, just hang on. We'll get there. So he says there, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Wow. You say, but Pastor John, where did he get that from? He was probably listening when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus was the one that told him that God equates hatred with murder. Listen to what Jesus said in John 5, verse 21 to 22. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. So they were thinking like, as long as I don't do what Cain did and kill somebody, take their life physically, then I'm okay. And he says, and you shall not commit murder. He says, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Got to be put to death. Verse 22, but I say to you, he did this six times in this chapter. He raised the stand. He said, you've heard it said this, but I'm telling you this. He said, you heard it said, don't commit murder. He said, but I'm telling you, everyone, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. The same court that the murderer is guilty before. Now the, now the angry person, because anger is equated with murder. And then he says, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, you shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, 
shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Wow. James tells us why somebody would engage in such a behavior. Because James is writing to some folks. He's writing to the saints scattered abroad. And, and he says, really, I'm looking out there at the audience, and I think I see some murderers out there. Listen to what James said about it. Do you think this is all new stuff? This is going on 2,000 years ago. James 4, 1 through 3, the Bible says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? That's a good question. Why are you all arguing? Why can't you all get along? And then he answers this question with a question. Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? That word pleasures is where we get a, a word hedonism from. What's hedonism? Hedonism is the attitude is all about me. So hedonism says, I want to take care of myself, and I don't care who else suffers for it. Look out for number one, even if you've got to step on number two. It's the mindset that it's all about me. And Paul would tell the church of Philippi, don't do that. Here's what you need to do. Consider others more important than yourself. So in case you're wondering what I'm talking about, let me explain to you how Jesus did that. And then he went on in great detail and described how Jesus came down here and died in that place. So James says that the source of the uh, quarrels and the conflicts among them is their pleasures, their hedonism, their selfish attitudes, their lack of love, and their hatred towards others. Now listen to what he said. He must have been listening when Jesus was preaching a sermon on the mount as well. And it says, you lust, you, you want things. You have a, a strong desire for things. It's not always a sexual kind of lust. It's a, a lust for something. That could be for money. It could be for fame. It could be for power. It could be for possessions. I have a desire for things. And he says, you lust and you do not have. So what do they do? They just content like Paul was? Uh, content to be in any situation? No. They commit murder. Wow. Yeah. Now, he wasn't talking about they physically and literally went out and killed people. That was the conflicts and the quarrels, the arguing, the fighting, the stuff that was going on. He said, so you, you, so you fight. He said, you, you are envious. Instead of them being content, they're envious. I see what somebody else has. Instead of saying, well, hey, praise the Lord, man. I'm so excited. You got a new car? Awesome. Man, I'm so excited to see that you got a, a better house. You put a new addition on your house. I'm so glad. You went on vacation. Hey, good for you. I'm glad you had a good time. No, instead of them being excited for other people, and even the same thing can happen in ministry. You, you baptized 10 last week? Well, it's probably not preaching the gospel. Probably just baptizing folks for the sake of baptizing them. Maybe not. Maybe they are preaching the gospel. Maybe people got saved. Instead of saying, God, thank God that the kingdom is growing. doesn't matter what's growing here at Real Impact or somewhere else. Thank God the kingdom is growing. We're in the kingdom business. We're not in the Real Impact church business. And so we ought to celebrate when others are doing well. And they should celebrate when we're doing well. Whether it be personally, ministry, whatever. It doesn't matter. And so he says, you're envious and you cannot obtain. So what do they do? Do they say, hey, I celebrate with you, brother. God bless you. I'm so glad to see that God's moving in your life. No, you fight and quarrel. Wow. Arguing, fussing and fighting, belittling. I'm mentoring a pastor right now, and, uh, and I told him I said, be very careful. I said, I would highly recommend that you don't share any information of what's going on in your church with another pastor in your association. Because here's what they'll do. They shouldn't be. They should be your biggest cheerleaders, but here's what they'll do. They'll try to badmouth you to try to get those members. I always felt like if they want to leave some other church and badmouth the pastor and come here, it won't be long before you're badmouthing me. So I don't want those kind of members. Uh, go, go back and do what Je uh, Jesus said there in, in Matthew 5. Go back and take care of business with your, the person you offended. And so instead of tearing others down, we should be building them up. So this is you fight and quarrel. Then he says you do not have because you do not ask. It's hard to have a good prayer life when you're fussing and fighting with others. Because if you get into your prayer closet and spend time with God, instead of just saying, God, I hope you see what they did. I hope you fix them, God. Did you hear what they said to me? I mean, somebody needs to straighten them out, God. And I'm going to ask that you go ahead and just pour down fire on them. That's what J James and John wanted to do. And Jesus said, you ain't got a clue what you're talking about. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> Have you seen that from me? You didn't know that from me, did you? And he's trying to call down fire on the people. He said, good night. And uh, <laughs> we got a lot of folks in the church. They're praying for you. Well, they're praying, God, get them, fix them, straighten them out. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Don't pray for me. And so it says you, you, you do not ask because you, you don't have no desire to go in. You can't go in there and spend time with God because the Holy Spirit will work you over. If you have bitterness in your heart towards somebody else and you spend time in God's Word and you don't just try to go find a verse to, to justify what you're doing, you read the Bible verse by verse, just like we preach verse by verse, the Holy Spirit will wear you out. 
And that's what Jesus said. I didn't read the whole context there in Matthew 5, but right after he was talking about don't, don't be uh, angry because you're a murderer, then he would say if you're down there at the altar and somebody's got a problem, go take care of business. And the Holy Spirit will work you over because he works me over. I'm telling you, when, I, when I'm not right with somebody else, it can't be very long before I get right because the Holy Spirit will wear me out. But these people, they couldn't even, they couldn't even spend time with God. They didn't even want to ask. And then, some of them they were because they wanted to hang in there and see what they could do. So then in verse 3 it says, You ask and you do not receive. Well, why isn't God answering their prayers? Here it is. Because you ask with wrong motives. See, they got the wrong motives. God said, I'm not going to answer that prayer. Uh, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Wow. Wait a minute. Now, the pleasures was a source of the conflicts and the quarrels up there in verse 1. So it's a circle. And what it is, they're angry at anybody else. And instead of them getting along, uh, James says, you, you can't because you're fussing and you're fighting and you're quarreling and you're angry. It, it's a shame. Thank God we don't have that kind of stuff going on here in this church. But I've been in business meetings where I had to just kind of say, hey, hey, hold on, guys. We have to shut it down. Y'all going to act like that and talk like that? We're going to shut the meeting down. I had to do that because it's starting to get very heated. Yeah. I heard about another church that was in the middle of a church split and they were very angry. And they had to get the director of missions to come in to meet and to moderate the, uh, the meeting. And he took a chair and he put it right down here in the very front. He said, I want you all to know who's sitting in this chair right here. He says, Jesus is sitting in this chair and he's watching everything that we're doing. Be very careful how you speak in this meeting. And isn't it a shame to do that? And church splits. Uh, not over doctrinal issues, always over the color of the carpet, where to put the piano, silly things that have nothing to do with kingdom business. And this was going on in the context of those who claim to be born again. And James says, there was murderers in there. John says, if you don't love, you're a murderer. Wow. So John says, uh, we know we have passed out of death into life. I know that I'm born again because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Once again, John is very bold, very clear. Those who claim to hate others uh, are not saved, and uh, uh, no matter what they claim. Listen to what John Phillips said. He said, an act of murder demonstrates that the murder is devoid of eternal life. And by the same token, hatred, which is the root of the sin of murder, likewise proves that the person who entertains them, this murderous spirit is devoid of eternal life. Both the fruit and the root reveal the unregenerate nature of such a person. He's a lost person. Wow. Wait a minute now. Is John saying that a Christian can never commit the act of murder? Uh, let me take another step. Is he saying that a murderer cannot be saved? No, like every sin, uh, it is possible uh, to commit an act of that sin. Not saying that somebody tells a lie one time, they get angry one time, they lust one time, they steal one time. There's an act of sin, and then there's a lifestyle of sin. And so anybody can do terrible things. David was a liar, an adulterer, and a murderer. Literally and physically. And yet, he knew the Lord. And the Bible said he, had a, he was a man after God's own heart. Because he didn't have a lifestyle of that. He repented when he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. So verse 15 says, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Wow. Like all sins, a lack of opportunity and a fear of punishment keeps most people from carrying out the murderous desires of their heart. If people could rob a bank... And be absolutely guaranteed there'd be no consequence if you rob that bank. More people would go rob a bank. If they knew that they could commit adultery and nobody would ever find out and they could have absolute guaranteed secrecy and the opportunity, more people would do it. I wonder how many people would murder somebody else if they knew there'd be absolutely no consequence whatsoever. Now, fear of going to jail and suffering the death penalty and the lack of opportunity. I don't know how to plan it. Keeps a lot of people from doing it. They had a movie series called The Purge. The movie was all about, they really wanted people to commit murder, but it was any crime. They said, we're going to give you one night a year, and you can commit any crime that you want, not against the government officials, because the government's with the ones funding it, but you can commit any crime that you want to commit, including murder. And they really encouraged the people to go out and do it. 
And they televised it and everything. That's what the whole movie series is all about, them doing that. And then we're well, probably asking the question, I wonder how many people would do that. And of course the movie is, there's some people don't want to do it, some people do want to do it, just like anything else. But I wonder how many people in the country would say, if we had that, that was reality, not a movie. And we said, the reality is you got one night, do whatever you want, rob a bank, steal a car, burn a house down, kill somebody, do whatever you want to do. One night is okay. No punishment whatsoever. Uh, but only during these hours. I wonder how many people would do some of these things. Yeah. When, when you say, I hope they die. I hope they burn in hell. Or you say, go to hell. Wow, really? Wow. I just hate that person. Hate? That's a strong word. Do you hate them? Just a little bit angry? Just don't love them enough? Do you hate them? Wow. And we say these things. And what we're really saying is, these desires are here. And just like Cain, God told him, sin is crouching at the door. I'm telling you, Cain, you're fixing to go down a path you don't want to go down. Right. And you've got to master it. And he didn't master it because he had no ability to master it because he didn't know, the, didn't know God. And he had no ability to do it. If he just said, you know what, God, I really did mess up there. <laughs> Whew, thanks for catching me. Uh, he'd have been fine. But he went out, talking to his brother, probably complaining, whining, and crying to his brother about how God loved him more than he loved me. We, we do that same thing sometimes, don't we? Yeah. God must love you more than me. Look, look at your kids are so healthy. My kids over here struggling. Uh, look, look at the nice house you live in, the house I live in. Uh, look at the good job that you have, and I'm over here struggling just to get by, paycheck to paycheck. Uh, look at the lifestyle you're living. Same thing in ministry. Look at the ministry you got over there, but everything going wonderful in your ministry. And I'm over here struggling. And we do the same things. All because the desires are in our hearts. And we've got to ask the Holy Spirit, God, I will mess up big time if you don't help me. I desperately need help. Or I will really make some bad choices. Fear of consequences or lack of opportunity keeps us from doing more than what's in our heart. But if it's in our heart, and God says, I'm looking at the heart. So Jesus said, yeah, if you're angry, I consider it murder. So even if you don't kill them, I still consider it murder. Yeah, you lust, even if you don't go sleep with them, I still consider it adultery. So Jesus says, I'm looking at the heart. So just because you don't do the act, that's not that big of a deal to me. God always looks at the heart. And I got to pray and say, God, would you please examine my heart? Because Jeremiah tells me that my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And only God can know it. Some people tell you, hey, follow your heart. I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't follow my heart. No. No, my heart is very deceitful, very desperately wicked. And I will engage in all kinds of terrible things if the Holy Spirit doesn't get a hold of me. What keeps me more now from doing it is that the Holy Spirit works me over. And sometimes I'm about to do something. And then I say, uh oh, uh, God help me there. And then I'll just not do it. But if you're not in tune with the Holy Spirit, you'll do a lot of things. And then afterwards you'll say, oh, I'm so sorry for that. You ever say something, and then you say later on, I didn't mean to say that. No, yes, you did. Yes, you did. It was in your heart. And Jesus said, what's in the heart comes out of the mouth. So maybe you didn't, you didn't want to say that because you didn't want to get caught and exposed for what was in your heart, but you just revealed yourself. So people get angry, people get drunk. They'll reveal what's in their heart. They'll say things and do things they normally wouldn't because their self-control is holding them in check. But the anger and the alcohol will cause them to act and say what's really in their heart. And Jesus said, it was in the heart. That's why it came out of the mouth. That's why you did that, because it's in your heart. So I've got to always say, if I ever do or say anything, not just anger, anything, lustful thoughts, lying to somebody, stealing things, complaining, all of it, whatever the behavior is, I've got to say, that was in my heart. And in a moment, a weakness, when I kind of let my guard down, it came out. So what I really do is say, God, you see what's in my heart, and you know what's there. And I need you to help me with what's in my heart. Because sometimes I drop my guard and it comes out. But that's so that everybody else can see it. God said, I already saw it. I already knew it was in there. And so we've got to really pray and say, God, would you please help me? Because I desperately, desperately need the Holy Spirit's help. I will mess up so big. So big. Wow. You, you may not struggle with these things like I do. You may be perfect and, and just like Jesus. I don't know. The Apostle Paul said he struggled. So I guess I'm going to be honest and confess that I struggle sometimes. And uh, if you don't struggle, then uh, pray for me. If you do struggle, pray for yourself. Because we all need prayer. We all need help. All need help. All need help. 
hey, uh, do you really know the Lord? John has been giving us a series of tests. This was a love test we took these, these last couple of days. Uh, but really, there's a lot of tests you've been giving us. The holiness test, the obedience test. So are we passing these tests? I'm giving you an open book test. I'm giving you the answers. You can't help pass the test when you have an open book and the answers given to you. The kids in school would love to have that. If they say, hey, we're having an open book test today, and not only are you going to go flipping through all the book and try to find it yourself, I'm going to give you the answers. Uh, <laughs> if you don't pass a test like that, then I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, that's a pretty easy test. They didn't give those tests to me when I was in, in school. When they did have an open book test, it, it was such a big book and you had to look so much and by the time you could find the answer, like, it didn't really help me at all that much. But when you got an open book test and you got the answers, you ought to get an A on every one of those tests. And so how are you doing on those tests that we took so far? Not just today, but the tests we've been taking the last few months. You passing the test? Because John's going to tell us here in a little bit. We're going to get there eventually, John. And he's going to tell us in chapter 5, verse 13. I wrote all this stuff down for you. And the reason why I did was so that you know that you're getting in. There should be no guesswork. No guesswork. He said, I, I, I wrote it all down so that you may know you have eternal life. John says, it's obvious who belongs to God, who doesn't. It's obvious. If you don't know, it's because you're not paying attention because it's obvious. And I just told you how you can know. So really, he's trying to help us out. So thank you, John, for writing it all down. Thank you for being very bold and clear, not beating around the bush, chasing rabbits everywhere and confusing me so I don't know what's going on. Thank you, John, for being very, very bold and clear. Uh, as the Holy Spirit told him to write all these things down, he wrote it all down, just like he was told to write it down. He didn't change it up a little bit and say, well, God, that's too soft. Let me put it this way. No, he wrote it down exactly what God told him to write down. It's all inspired by, by, uh, by the Holy Spirit. And so thank you, John, for doing that. Hey, let's stand for prayer. The altar's going to be wide open. And here's the invitation today. It may be that you want to really come down here and say, God, uh, the, the teacher is the one that you know, always grades the test. I never got a test and they say, you grade it yourself. Uh, you can always change the answers. The teacher always grades the test. So it's not so much how I answer the questions and say, yeah, I feel pretty good about that. The Holy Spirit, would you take a look at the test I just took and reveal to me, have I ever been born again? Do I have a relationship with you? And if so, then say, God, how can I improve in that relationship? Because I'll never be perfect this side of glory, so I can always do better. And so maybe I do love people, but maybe not enough. And John's going to give us a very clear way next week. And he's going to tell us, here's how you can really know if you love somebody. And it's going to be very, very clear for us. So we're going to look at that next week. So you come back again. And, uh, but you need to come down to this altar and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you and reveal to you your spiritual state. Are you saved? Or are you lost? And if you're saved, uh, how are you doing in that relationship? It's one thing to be saved and just barely get in. I want to be saved and as close to God as I can possibly be. I got a long, long way to go. I need a lot of prayer. I need a lot of prayer. If you're perfect, come down here and pray for me. Would you do that, please? And come and pray. And pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us today. They're at home. Same thing. God wants to speak directly into your heart right now. And so I need you to put that coffee cup down. I need you to stop all the distractions. And I need you to focus right now. As the Holy Spirit speaks to you during this time of invitation. This is our last song. And then we're done. And then we're done. So let's, uh, let's pray. And then the invitation is going to be given. And uh, Mike has a song for us. We'll come to the altar. If you want me to pray with you or for you, it's my privilege to do so. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, but you come and pray as the Holy Spirit leads you. And uh, again, if you're perfect, pray for me. I'm not. Father, in Jesus' name, we are in desperate need of the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives. Truths that we need to be aware of. And what we know that Satan whispers and distracts us during a time like this. And Father, we know that we can deceive ourselves. But your word is clear that we must never be deceived. And only the Holy Spirit can help us to understand truth. And so, Lord, I pray that even right now, every distraction be removed from every person. That the Holy Spirit will speak directly to our hearts and minds, personally, individually. And, Father, I pray you reveal to us our spiritual condition. Are we saved or are we still lost? Are we a false convert? And, Lord, if we are saved, how are we doing in our walk with you? What areas do we need to improve in? And, Lord, we dare not say that there are no areas because we know that we're not perfect. So, Father, help us to improve in every area of our life, become more like Jesus. Father, I pray you'd move mightily here on campus and there at home. Let the Holy Spirit do as he desires. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.